Hi everyone, I'm Shauna and welcome to my channel. Today I'm bringing you a video that's important to me. In this video, I'm going to be talking about my cruelty-free status and it's changing and I'm gonna be explaining why it's changing and my thoughts about the cruelty-free status in general. And that's gonna be the first part of the video. Um, why my opinions have changed and like what specifically has changed. And then in the second part of the video, I'm going to be talking about like the cruelty free community and that part of the video aren't, it's not really reasons why I'm not cruelty free anymore. That's not really a label that I want for myself, but it's things that I've noticed about the community itself or the label and things that I've noticed that I feel like if there's a place to talk about them, this is the place to talk about them. Hi everyone, I'm quickly jumping on here before you see the rest of this video to just say that this video was filmed at the very beginning of October, maybe in the first week or so, and it's just taken me a long time to get it up. In since then, there are a couple of content creators who have made videos expressing their views about um, about the cruelty-free status. Um, I'm thinking of Kyla Fish and Tara Brooke. So their videos are going to be linked in the description and they, I hadn't seen them when this video was initially filmed. This video is most inspired by Sarah Rose and while the Kyla Fish, Tara Brooke videos weren't out yet at that time, hers was and I had watched it and she was somebody who was making me think about my own status and helping me think through some of these issues. So my video is inspired by hers. I'm gonna link all three of those videos in the description box below. I want to make that very clear um, and to also say that I have now seen both of those videos and I wanna point you their way if you wanna hear other people talking about their cruelty-free status. Okay, that's it, enjoy the video. So yes, my opinion on cruelty-free is changing and I feel like that's important to discuss because that's going to affect my channel in the brands that I could and will be featuring and I also feel like there's a discussion here because while I felt this way for a long time or probably six months to a year there might be some of you who also felt this way and I really want to have a discussion because Again, although I felt this way for a year and I feel pretty strongly like that this this direction is permanent, I also understand and give myself the latitude to know that not everything is permanent and that I could in the future change my mind. So this is how I'm feeling now. If you have your own ideas about cruelty-free, cruelty-free status, please share them in the comments below because I do I do want a discussion because my opinion is my own, it's mine, and other people might believe in things or have different ideas or considerations that I haven't thought about. I also wanna make it clear before we start that I don't condemn anybody who's cruelty-free. It's your choice. And if this is something that you really believe in, please do it. And just because my opinions have changed doesn't mean that I think that people who are cruelty-free are making bad choices. No, I went cruelty free in 2016 or 2017. I can't remember exactly when. So three to four years ago. And at that time, that decision was really easy. My thought process went like this. Animal testing for cosmetics is unnecessary and there are alternatives to animal testing. Therefore, I don't want to support animal testing. It was, it was, at the beginning, it was a no-brainer and it felt like a black and white issue. I'm against animal testing, therefore I'm against cosmetic brands who test on, animal te who test on animals, therefore I won't support them. And at that time, I wasn't aware of animal testing laws, um, especially in China. And China is going to play a little bit of a role in my discussion. We're going to be talking about the ethical implications of cruelty-free um, and like how the community or how that name is framed um, and China and Chinese laws. Um, also the subjective nature of the status and its impact on the community too. And I didn't think about any of these things at that time. I wasn't really aware of them. And as I got into 
more of the community, I, I did gain this knowledge and my perspective on all of these things have changed. And since then, since 2016, since 2017, there are a lot of issues that have come to light that have changed my mind. And the biggest overall category of consideration, which is like, it's the single biggest factor, is that there are other important categories of consideration. Animal testing isn't the only ethical implication or issue when it comes to cosmetics. There are issues of ingredients, which is why the clean beauty space exists. There are uh, racism issues within uh, brands themselves and their products. There are child, labor's implica child labor implications. There are issues with palm oil and deforestation. Also issues of like packaging and plastic and like the eco-conscious aspect of makeup too. Also um, animal ingredients and bi byproducts that are used in cosmetics. And these are all factors of consideration that, that are equal to or some might be more important than animal testing. But the bottom line is that these are all potential factors of consideration. And so for me, portraying animal testing as a status, like I'm cruelty free, being somebody who identifies as such is for me a one dimensional, is one dimensional. And it takes issue with, with one issue and puts it above everything else. So here's an example. Catrice, they are cruelty free, but their largest complexion their their complexion product with the largest shade range oh i don't think i'm phrasing it right catrice's largest shade range is seven that is for one product they have seven shades and that's their max everything else has like four to five shades catrice is cruelty free but they are very exclusive they are devaluing black and brown consumers by not making products in their shade range that part of the makeup industry, the anti-racist part, is for me more important than cruelty-free status. And as somebody who has um, a YouTube channel, there are people who are like you who are watching this video who come to my channel. And that does make a difference about who I'm supporting and, and who I want to bring to the channel because I am aware that my word, my presence does have influence. But even when we when we go we go one step further with this with this Catrice example, Maybelline is a non cruelty free brand, and they only have one product at least that I'm aware of and that sells in Canada that has less than ten shades, and it is their BB cream. I think it has four to six shades. I'm not totally sure. So Maybelline's worst product has a similar number of shades to Catrice's best product. And in this example, Catrice is like portrayed as the hero because they're cruelty free and they're considered a more ethical brand. But animal testing is not the only ethical implication and that's the entire point. And if we take this again another step further, if we talk about accessibility makeup, because accessibility is very important. Accessibility in terms of price point and accessibility in terms of actually being physically able to get a product. And in Canada, Catrice is sold at Canada's most expensive drugstore and online only where you need to make a minimum purchase of $50 to get free shipping. So they're a much more difficult brand to find as well. So Maybelline is more accessible and has more shade ranges. Catrice is cruelty free. Also, neither of these brands uses sustainable packaging. Neither of these brands is really considered clean or has vegan options. And so there is much more to this issue than cruelty free. And I feel like this cruelty free status just makes it one dimensional. Also, when we look at higher end brands, I'm thinking even of brands like Mac or um, Benefit or NARS, none of these brands are cruelty free. Benefit has consistently in their history basically refused to cater to dark skin to dark skin people. Not just in their complexion products, which is sad, 
by the way, but also in their bronzers and their highlighters and their blushes. It took them like 10 years to come out with the darker shade of the Hoola bronzer. Benefit is not equal to NARS. NARS ha has been a brand who has historically had a diverse shade range, minimum thir 30 shades for majority of their products for over 10 years. And they've also shown black models in their advertising. I've also heard really great things about the internal structure of NARS. These brands are not equal, even though they're both kind of condemned as not being cruelty free. And I'm sure that there are other high end examples. Mac, another great company that has really great shade range, it is very accessible in Canada. You can get it at basically any mall. You can also get it online at Mac's website, also at Sephora's website. It's a very accessible brand with great shade ranges and also different lines for different skin types. And they also have a back to Mac program, which is a sustainability initiative because bolt lipstick packaging can be difficult to recycle because there are different component parts made of different materials. And so if they already have a recycling program in place, that is head and shoulders above the majority of brands at the drugstore and at Sephora. And I'm just using Sephora as an example because we don't have Ulta in Canada. So Mac could be a better option than buying, let's say, Anastasia. And if we, I do also want to touch on accessible and accessibility in makeup as well, because if I only promoted cruelty-free brands that had a minimum number of shade range, a minimum number of shades in their range, let's say 10, that would leave about four out of 15 Canadian drugstore brands. One of those brands is a Canadian brand, which is irrelevant to most people outside of Canada. That leaves three brands and that would make accessible makeup basically non-existent on my channel and things that you can get elsewhere like, um, like Elf at the Canadian drugstore. We don't have very large lines and they're only increasing. So really that's three brands at the drugstore level that I could talk about on my channel. And you could say that maybe it's selfish of me. There are other options. I could go high end, but I'm also discounting accessible makeup and I'm discounting the overwhelming majority of drugstore brands. And so who am I to discount Maybelline if they're one of the few brands who are catering to black and brown people at the drugstore? And I don't want this channel to just be a white refuge that like come here because you're white. That's not the case. I want to be able to recommend products and talk about products that are serving more than white people. Even when we talk about hair care, that's the same kind of story. If you walk into um, the regular hair care aisle, there's only a handful of brands who are cruelty free and at an affordable price. And you can find most of those brands in the three to maybe $6 range. Now, when you go, to the specialty section of the drugstore where it's the more natural, eco-friendly, vegan kinds of brands, that three to six dollars now goes nine to fifteen dollars a bottle. I think that some brands are worth it. Attitude is a Canadian brand. I love me Canadian brand. And they're one of the best brands I know. They're carbon neutral, they're EWG certified, they plant trees with every item. They're vegan. They're cruelty free. They're doing so much right. And I love supporting that brand, but they are a little expensive. And honestly, truth be told, I don't have $30 to spend on shampoo and conditioner all the time. Sometimes sure. And yes, I have bought shampoo and conditioner that were $30 a bottle in the past. Not very often, but still. And there are honestly months where the money just isn't there. That cannot be a priority. 
And I don't want to feel guilty for spending shampoo and conditioner, for spending $6 on shampoo and conditioner. I just, I have been racked with guilt sometimes because it's just like not in the budget and I need that shampoo, I need that conditioner. That's exactly why I bought those Dove products before I had my channel. I was having this internal battle of feeling like shit because I couldn't find any cruelty-free dandruff shampoos and conditioners in my drugstore that were under like $15 a bottle, so I bought Dove, I just did it. And I felt horrible for a long time because of that decision and I don't, I personally, maybe it's selfish, I cannot have that guilt anymore. So I am giving myself that leeway to buy that $6 shampoo and conditioner set if that's what's in the budget. And I'm not gonna justify my purchases to anybody or even myself. So I also wanna talk about vegan makeup. Um, there are actually only two brands at the drugstore that are 100% vegan. And that's Quo and Elf. And this also isn't a black and white issue either because Quo's foundation range is about 10 shades and Elf's foundation range in the Canadian drugstore is around six to seven. They only ever have a handful of shades. Seven, I think, is being generous. Their range in store isn't great. And so if you want to, again, if we're talking about accessible makeup, while Elf is a really, really affordable price point, if you have black or brown skin, you may not be able to get Elf at the Canadian drugstore. And Elf is definitely an interesting brand because I don't have a primarily Canadian audience. And even so, shipping from Elf's website is fairly inexpensive to Canada. I think it's like $4. And there is conversion. So... Elf is definitely a brand that I'm okay supporting, but even Quo, like when we're talking about Quo, I was a little hesitant about, I do want, okay, I want to review Quo because it is Canadian, it is cruelty-free, and it is vegan, and I'm all about supporting uh, Canadian brands when possible, and I do think that cruelty-free is a good thing, vegan is a good thing, so I would like to bring a review on that and it is very accessible. But at the same time, their shade range is only about 10 shades. So I haven't really done anything with it because I haven't really felt comfortable supporting the brand and I just feel torn on the issue. And even for you know Canadian makeup, there's not a lot of reviews on Quo or Annabelle. And so this is like an underserved part of of YouTube or an underserved, like these brands are are underserved and if you're looking for a review, it's gonna be difficult to find one. So there is a space for that. And I know that I can't be a perfect person who understands and knows about all the potential issues and does the right thing all the time, does it perfectly. And there's just so many niches, like vegan beauty or clean beauty. And there are issues with all of these brands and when I'm going to explore clean beauty I do want to try and do the best I can while thinking about many of these issues but the point is that cruelty free isn't the issue I want to prioritize above all else and the name itself it conveys ethics and honestly, a moral superiority. Like the name is cruelty. It implies that you individually, by purchasing this product, are cruel. You support cruelty. It's manipulative. And I think it's intentional, intentionally manipulative, but also like non-cruelty free. I feel like that's just a weird name too. And that name is misleading because your cruelty free product can have dead animals and animal parts in them. I don't know what's worse, having dead animals and animal parts in my product or having the assurance that your product was tested on animals. They're both pretty shitty in my opinion. So that name is misleading. I'm, you know, I'm not personally decided on all of the vegan issues like honey as an example. It is again another complicated issue. At the beginning of the year, I did say I wanted to transition to um, 
eventually 100% vegan makeup kind of skincare routine. And I'm not sure that that's 100% where I want to go. I think it's more like buy vegan when I can and my stands on ingredients are more like on a case by case basis. I think keratin is absolutely nasty um, and avoid products with keratin, but I'm also not against honey all the time. So it is, it is complicated. I also want to talk about China. And China is the reason why in 2020, the cruelty-free issue exists at all. Chinese policy is confusing, but here's what I know. China has reduced their animal testing significantly over the past decade. And they have been working towards ending animal testing for several years now. The progress is happening and post-market testing is almost completely over. Spot testing can happen. Um, and new laws for imported cosmetics and pre-market testing are set to take place uh, for January 2021. The bottom line is that China is moving in that direction and they have been for a while. For many brands like Dove as an example, their only concern for their cruelty-free status is post-market testing as far as I'm aware. And post-market testing is rare and generally only used when a product is flagged or for some reason issues, skin issues, or I feel like you know what I mean. So Dove to many people isn't considered cruelty-free specifically because of post-market testing because China may at one time, one day, potentially test it on animals. And even if, at least as far as I'm aware, if the product is pulled, it also doesn't guarantee it's going to be tested on animals either way. But even if we assume that it will be, it's just a potential. And it feels kind of crazy to me to say Dove is not cruelty-free because they one day maybe potentially might be pulled to be test to get tested and that test might be on an animal. And all this focus on China and Chinese laws, it's a unique situation because they're the only country in the world that requires, actually requires animal testing. But the focus on China feels more than that, that there's a racializing of a people and an emphasis that reinforces negative stereotypes of China. It feels like there's an implication of backwardness of Chinese law and therefore Chinese people and that they are, that China is somehow not modern, that they are ignorant um, and other implications, um, especially in the time of COVID and intense racism towards Chinese people, that it feels very specific and targeted and there are underlying racialization and racial motives, racialization of the people and kind of racist motives. And like there feels like disgust and disdain at Chinese, the Chinese government for reasons why I've said, and the talk about it is like, I don't understand why the Chinese government is still doing it. I don't get it. It's so stupid. I've heard kind of rhetoric like that. I can't pretend like I know everything or even a lot of things about Chinese culture, but it feels very American or Western to assume that Western ways of doing things is how everybody should do things and that we know the answers. We have the right answers. And that feels like what's happening with China. And it makes me extremely uncomfortable. So where is the disgust and disdain for the Canadian government for not outlawing animal testing? China isn't the only place where animal testing can happen legally for cosmetics and related items. We spend so much time judging each other over who's cruelty free, which brands are cruelty free, which brands aren't demonizing people for supporting very specific brands who were able to get around Chinese laws, you know, people saying they are, people saying that they aren't, just like Physicians Formula. Our energies are better suited elsewhere. And let's be clear, cruelty free is subjective. It's a human construction 
I can say that because there are different levels of being cruelty free. It feels like who is the most ethical? There, there are different levels at a brand level or at a parent company level, a parent company level. And if this was a black and white issue, I'm against animal testing everywhere, then there wouldn't be this subjective nature of, oh, this brand isn't and this brand is. And I'm just kind of tired of people fighting over brands like Physicians Formula or what in a while. It almost doesn't matter. And I'm going to tell you why. And when also when I talk about the cruelty-free that people's energies can be spent better spent elsewhere, that is related here. The cruelty-free community has positioned itself as to fix this issue. The way to do it is only and primarily through consumption. Maybe it's who I watch and perhaps I don't have a clear idea of the whole community because of that. But if you've also, if you, if you've experienced different, please, please share that experience. There is this idea that by going cruelty free, um, pressure will be put on companies to become non cruelty free. So that's the belief that by buying specific products from specific brands, enough pressure will mount to create change. I haven't heard of cruelty-free YouTubers who suggested getting involved with companies like Cruelty Free International, donating your time or money, or basically in any way advocating getting political about a cruelty-free status or cruelty-free issues in general. Education is important. Educating is mostly coming in terms of which brands are cruelty-free and which brands aren't, and to some extent Chinese law. It feels really mismatched. To believe that Chinese laws are the problem and if China changed its laws then there would be no need for this cruelty-free debate at all. If this is the belief then to me it would make sense to advocate or get involved with brands who are advocating against these laws because it's these brands like Cruelty Free International and there are a handful of others. These have been the brands who have worked with the Chinese government and who have consulted and who have advocated. These are the brands who are making the change. In this instance, it's not consumers buying Too Faced over Mac. And so I'm saying it's mismatched because the advocacy is generally about brands and messages have been about specific brands when the problem has been deemed Chinese law. And history has told us, at least in Canada and the United States, and has showed us that boycotts have worked and consumers do have the power to use their consumption behaviors to boycott brands, to change brands, and to use their consumer behaviors to achieve political action. A modern example of that is the dairy industry. There, the number of people switching from dairy milk to plant milk is wreaking havoc on the American dairy industry. I think it was in 2019, they collectively, the dairy industry lost a billion dollars. And there are like the 15% pledge that is also using consumer behavior and spending power for good. But in this case, I'm not convinced. Companies are going to China simply because entering China opens up over a billion, opens the company up to over a billion consumers. Companies are in the business of making money and therefore they're going to China to make more money. China is a lucrative business opportunity and perhaps for you this is just like a completely ethical stance like if you go to China at all you're unethical and I don't want to support you. Okay fine. But this framework serves to make the individual feel better about their singular individual choices. China's not going to change their laws because some people outside of China said that they disagree. How do we change laws? We change laws through political action. Even so, you know, cruelty for YouTubers, they're focusing on brands and not China and the Chinese laws anyways. And so the people who are making the changes are companies like Cruelty Free International who have been involved with the Chinese government. This is where the political action needs to be. And if you want to spend your time in this cruelty-free space,
I don't know, maybe am I on a high horse by saying get involved with Cruelty Free International instead of fighting with other people about is physicians cruelty free, is it not? Back in 2018, we all applauded CoverGirl for becoming cruelty free certified and hoped that that would set a precedent. It's clear in, you know, the end of 2020, it's about two years, that that didn't happen. Nobody followed suit. They didn't set a precedent. Um, But I understand the ethics of it. However, you can't go call CoverGirl more ethical than Maybelline simply because CoverGirl is cruelty-free Maybelline isn't. It also feels a bit crazy to rely on specific bloggers and their categories of cruelty-free status to determine yours. That is subjective as well. And these are mostly Americans fo- focusing on American brands. One brand doesn't need to certify with a hundred cruelty-free bloggers that they're cruelty-free. They don't need to do that. And if a brand doesn't want to cater to the whims of beauty bloggers, then they don't get certified by them as cruelty-free. And even when we look at small companies, they might not have the money to go after these cruelty-free titles because they do cost money. So they're not going to be cruelty-free because some beauty blogger says they're not. Supporting a small business is often, even when they haven't checked out their supply chains, supporting a small business is more important than their cruelty-free status, at least for me. If we want these changes to happen, to me, that means getting political. At least that's what it should mean, but that's not what it's generally meant for the community. And so lack of political action in the community is not inherently a reason to not be cruelty-free. Those were just some things that have kind of irked me. The reason why I'm not cruelty-free anymore or making that a major consideration is because there are other things that are more important or at the very least equally important. I want to do the right thing for my channel and people who come to my channel. Um, I also have personal issues that I find compelling like the environment and climate change and racial justice too. These are all factors I'm considering when I'm buying makeup. Honestly, there are going to be some points where I'm going to go for that drugstore $6 lipstick because that's what's affordable. But at other points, I might go for that $60 foundation because it's made by a company that's really doing innovative things with their packaging and they're eliminating plastic. Or I might go with Attitude for hair care products sometimes because they're also doing really great environmental things. I might go to NARS because they have great shade ranges. But if I can find companies that that are doing a lot of great things at once, I would like to showcase them too. I hope that this video is useful to you in some way if you've been feeling unsure or if you want to have a discussion about it, I do welcome that. So that's going to wrap up this video. Thank you for listening and thank you for being here today. I appreciate you and I appreciate that you spent the time to be here with me today. This has been a topic on my mind for a long time. And when I started my channel, I felt like I should do the right thing and maintain my cruelty-free status. And for me, doing the right thing now means something else. Okay, so that's it. Um, That's everything I have to say (laughs) today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again around here soon. Bye.